The Siege Perilous is back in the spotlight these days within the pages of the new X-Book Knights of X. In the book, Betsy Braddock and a team of champions have been tasked by Roma to find the mystic artifact and bring it to her if they ever hope to get home to Krakoa and bring peace to Otherworld again. Since claiming control of Otherworld, Merlin has made it his personal mission to wipe out all the mutants within the Ten Kingdoms. So, between fending off Merlin's forces and trying to find the Siege Perilous, Betsy and her new team definitely have their hands full. Betsy was stranded in Otherworld at the conclusion of the Reign of X's Excalibur series after she and her team unsuccessfully tried to fend off Merlin and King Arthur's attack on the Starlight Citadel. Merlin won, causing the mutants to have to scramble and retreat, all except for Betsy, who stuck behind to continue fighting the good fight. The Krakoan gates to and from Otherworld were destroyed, and with Betsy and Saturnine and the Captain Britain Corps on the run from Merlin, Betsy knew she needed help and she besieged Roma for an army of Krakoans to help stop Merlin's genocide. But unfortunately, the most Roma could do was give Betsy the mystical quest to find the Perilous, and thus let her bring some friends along to complete it. The team Betsy chooses is comprised mostly of her previous Excalibur team, but it also has a few new faces to grace the page. Richter, Gambit, Shogo, Shatterstar, Bay the Blood Moon, and Megan all return, along with some fresher recruits like Rachel, Kylan, and King Arthur's mutant son, Mordred. I was actually under the impression that there would be a mysterious 11th member of the team, just based on what I thought was a shadowy silhouette next to the shadowy silhouette of Kylan in the group photo, but so far that has not been the case and the shadowy silhouette may indeed just be a shadow after all. In any case, Betsy and Co. are hot on the trail to find the Siege Perilous and hopefully overthrow Merlin in the process, and I gotta say, the series is already far more enjoyable than Excalibur ever was. In this video, I'm going to chat a little bit about the history of the Siege Perilous in the X-Men comics, including all of the various different forms it has taken. This is part one of a two-part series, the second of which I will be talking about what happens to all the different people who have traveled through the Perilous in the past. So make sure to stay tuned for that one if you want to know how this mysterious amulet works. The Siege Perilous is a concept that's originally rooted in medieval Arthurian mythology. It's the name of a seat that's at King Arthur's round table that is fatal for anyone else to sit in it aside from the one who is destined to find the Holy Grail. In the legends, that person is Galahad as he survives sitting in the Siege Perilous seat and he makes his way to successfully find the Holy Grail. Or so Wikipedia has told me. In the world of the X-Men though, the Siege Perilous is something different entirely. It's a mystical artifact that can take on many different forms. It's been a circle of stones, a giant mirror, but primarily it's seen as this, like rectangular shaped amulet. It is a ruby center and these super dangerous looking pointy spikes that protrude from its corners that kind of remind me of Spiral's helmet. Officially, the Perilous' first appearance was in Captain Britain number one. There, it appeared as a circle of stones, kind of resembling a tiny Stonehenge, and it's where Brian Braddock woke up after accidentally driving his motorcycle off a cliff. He was greeted by astral projections of Merlin and Roma, where they welcomed him to the Siege Perilous, imploring him to choose between the Amulet of Right or the Sword of Might, with his eternal soul hanging in the balance. Brian chose the amulet, which was the exact thing Roma was hoping he'd pick, and thus he became Captain Britain, the UK's primordial hero, and gained all of his Britannic might and glory. Because that's exactly what the Siege Perilous does. It inextricably changes someone based on the choices that they've made throughout their life, giving them essentially a second chance but on a different course. Many of the X-Men have used the Siege Perilous for this very reason, mostly to escape a life or death situation, and always at the risk of not knowing how they'll come out on the other side. The Siege Perilous' first X-Men appearance was in Uncanny X-Men number 229. Here, it appeared in its more familiar gem-like form, and Roma gave it to the team as a means to deal with the enemies they defeat so as not to blow their cover of pretending to be dead. The X-Men were currently faking their deceasement to the world at large, and were hoping that this reputation would give them the upper hand in getting the jump on their enemies. For the most part it worked, but the problem with pretending to be dead is that there's no way to hand over your enemies that you defeat to the proper authorities without blowing your cover. Enter Roma, who gifted them the Siege Perilous so that the X-Men could simply send their foe through the portal and let the fates decide what to do with them. And that's exactly what they did. They started by tossing in a whole bunch of Reavers, and though we never really know what became of most of them after the celestial powers weighed the good and bad of their lives, it can be assumed that they probably got a second chance, cause the siege just be forgiven like that. 
It was next used to eliminate the threat of the recently merged Nimrod and Master Mold in Uncanny X-Men number 247. This super robo mega combo literally had the X-Men on the brink of total defeat until Dazzler summoned the siege and it sucked the artificial intelligences through its portal, unfortunately taking Rogue along with it. Then came the siege's biggest moment and probably what it is most memorable for. In Uncanny X-Men number 251, the reformed Reavers were back for revenge against the X-Men, and Psylocke had a premonition of the whole team dying at their hands, unless they escaped through the Siege Perilous. The team felt uneasy about it, because it's literally a life-changing moment to go through the portal, as there's no going back. With the Reavers at their doorstep, the team of Colossus, Dazzler, Havoc, and Psylocke all stepped through, some with a little mental suggestion from Bretzi to help put some pep in that step, and they escaped their destined deaths. The gem was crushed by Donald Pierce afterwards, and raged at having missed his chance to finally kill the X-Men. This moment changed the X-Men comics big time, as it's probably what marks the beginning of the end of the classic Chris Claremont X-Men lineups as we knew them. New creative forces were coming in behind the scenes, like Jim Lee, and a mere 30 issues later, the penultimate 90s golden blue teams that pretty much still define the X-Men and pop culture to this day would officially be formed. But I always believe that, were it not for this moment of the Siege Perilous splitting everybody up in the outback, then we may never have gotten to where we ended up with today in quite the same way as we did. After Pierce crushed the gem, the Siege Perilous kept itself pretty scarce and out of the comics for many, many years. The next time it showed up was in Captain Britain and MI-13 number 1 during the Skrulls' secret invasion of Earth. Captain Britain and his team were dealing with the onslaught of sudden Skrull infiltration reveals amongst their own ranks, and a concentration of Skrull activity was discovered to be assembling itself at the very same Stonehenge-like rock formation where Brian first obtained his powers back in Captain Britain number 1. This is the second time the siege appeared as a circle of rocks, and Brian and his team went off to defend it so that the Skrulls couldn't use the gate to invade Otherworld. It turns out the Skrulls didn't want to seize the siege, but instead wanted to destroy it, as they had created their own gate to Otherworld within their ship, and wanted to be the only ones with access to that mystical realm. The Skrulls fired a missile at the Siege Perilous, and even though Brian tried his darndest to get there in time to repel it, the missile detonated and successfully obliterated the Siege, also killing Captain Britain in the process. He, of course, soon got better and was resurrected by Merlin, and he and his team of British superheroes fought off the Skrulls' attack, eventually thwarting their quest to control all of the world's magic. But the Siege Perilous is a resilient relic, and a mere Skrull missile can't keep a good portal down. It turned back up in the pages of Wolverine and the X-Men as part of the Hellfire Saga in issues 31 to 35, when Cade Kilgore was recruiting other kids for his new Hellfire Academy, with teachers like Mystique and Sauron and Wendigo on staff. An archaeologist found the Siege Perilous, which had now taken the form of a full-on body-length mirror, and he submitted himself to the Siege's transformation opportunity and came out the other end as the Philistine, vowing to be the Siege's guardian forevermore. The Philistine and the Siege Perilous were brought to Cade's Hellfire Academy, where students who were underperforming were subjected against their wills to its reality-warping powers and were ultimately transformed into more powerful, angrier versions of themselves. Cade tried to sacrifice Quentin Choir to the Siege in order to make him more malleable to his machinations, but the portal surprisingly rejected Quentin, which suggested to the Philistine that Quentin still had a bigger destiny yet to be fulfilled on his current path. Eventually, the X-Men ambushed the Hellfire Academy, and all Hellfire broke loose, but the Philistine wouldn't let anyone go until the Siege had its share of victims. Cade tried to sacrifice all the heroes in order to satiate the Mirror's hunger, but he was backstabbed by his co-conspirator, Wilhelmina Kensington, who entered the Mirror of her own free will along with the Philistine. The Mirror started to overload, so everyone made a great escape for it, except for Wolverine's brother Dog Logan, who was also one of the Hellfire Academy teachers, and he grabbed Cade Kilgore and jumped them both into the portal moments before its energy buildup exploded everything around them. But as usual, the siege survived, and at the end of the arc, it is seen in one piece as a mirror underwater with Cade Kilgore trapped inside of it. We've also seen a few alternate universe versions of the Siege Perilous, which I'm only really mentioning here because the Siege is supposed to be like some sort of all-existing focal point of all realities, so even though these are all universe versions of it, 
Does it not stand to reason that it is one and the same everywhere? I think that's giving the comic book world way too much credit to canonize, but just in case it is supposed to be considered as the one and same true item, let's just talk about these alternate universe versions briefly anyway. During the Secret Wars 3 event, where the multiverse was shattered and reshaped into battle world and filled with all sorts of topsy-turvy domains, the Siege Perilous made an appearance in Arachnia within the Spider-Verse series, this time as a stone seat, much like Arthurian legend. Baron Norman Osborn was going to use it to make himself more powerful, but a whole bunch of spider people discovered it and figured out his plan. They were going to destroy it when a Thor intervened, thinking it was their weapon against Doctor Doom, and so she sought to destroy them instead. Nothing really came from this Siege Perilous moment, aside from the big battle that everybody was fighting over it, though we did get to see some slight reality warping from it, and of course, Norman getting his brain fried out from it too. A more prominent version of the Siege Perilous appeared in the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon series, and also in its comic book counterpart. Here, the Siege Perilous looked like the gem that we all know and love, and the Goblin used it to absorb Electro in order to make it powerful enough to help him travel across the Spider-Verse so that he could steal DNA samples from various Spider-People. His plan was totally working, and he used it to travel everywhere from 2099 to Spider-Ham's world, but when he got back to the Prime Reality, Electro was ultimately freed from the Perilous, and he fried the Goblin's ass for using him. Spider-Man used the Siege to send all of his brand new Spider-Friends home, but then it showed up again later, this time in the hands of Baron Mordo. Baron used it to summon the Goblin to fight Spider-Man, but of course no one likes taking orders and everyone is just power hungry, so instead they all fought each other over control of the Perilous, while Spider-Man and Doctor Strange tried to get it out of harm's way. The Goblin eventually got it, and used it to shatter Baron Mordo, but then Miles Morales one-upped him and used it to explode upon itself and apparently take the Goblin along with it. This explosion caused a whole bunch of ripples throughout the multiverse, and the web warriors were tasked by Madame Web and Nick Fury to collect the shards of the Siege Perilous in order to stop the dimensions from colliding upon themselves, eventually succeeding in reforming them and trusting it into Spider-Gwen's care. Later, Baron Mordo returned and used his aspect of the siege that he had retained to turn people into their Halloween costumes in a classic TV plot that never gets old. But through the power of their own imaginations, Spider-Man and his friends are able to counter Mordo's spells and return him to the world where the siege had banished him to in the first place. That was it for the Siege Perilous in this universe, but a fun version of it did show up in the 2021 Heroes Reborn series. This series was all about what the world would look like if the Avengers never formed, and it focuses mainly on the cast of the Squadron Supreme. If you've never read the 1980s 12-issue Squadron Supreme maxi-series, I highly recommend picking it up. None of it's X-Men related, but the story has such an interesting ethical and moral backbone examining power and corruption and the greater good that I can't help but recommend it as required comic book reading. Anyway, it doesn't really have anything to do with this topic at hand, as this is a Squadron Supreme from a different time, and in it, Power Princess is the holder of the Siege Perilous, whom she has nicknamed Perry. Apparently, she came into its possession after killing Ileana in her Dark Child form, and she has been keeping it ever since, mainly using it for company and as a bartender to refill her drinks with cross-dimensional ales. That was the most recent alt-universe examination of the Siege, although we can't forget the Universe X version, which technically is supposed to take place in the future anyway. Here, it is a giant set of doors, and passing through them can bring you to the brink of the Omniverse, where resides Roma, Merlin, and Psylocke. Psylocke is apparently undergoing some Omniversal training here, probably in an effort to take over Roma's spot as the Omniversal Guardian. Its only plot point within this series was for the heroes to use it in an effort to get information out of Merlin, but as usual, Merlin is not very forthcoming, and the heroes are sent away without much ado about anything. So, not counting any of that alternate universe stuff, the main 616 Siege Perilous canon of today has Roma telling Betsy that the Siege Perilous has been misplaced somewhere within Otherworld. In the latest issue of Knights of X number 3, Betsy and her team travel to Sevalith in order to visit with Apocalypse's son Death, who was being held as a prisoner there, to see if he had any insight into where the siege might be. He confirmed that his father in fact hid the siege somewhere in another world, and after translating a passage from Apocalypse's grimoire that Richter had been holding on to, it turns out that the siege is with the X-Men's old acquaintance Mr. M. 
Mr. M has been notably absent in the X comics ever since the new Krakoa era debuted. He was on a list of Omegas a long time ago, with his whereabouts being kept super vague and mysterious at the time. Since the Ten of Swords tournament though, we've known that at some point he made the move over to Otherworld, where he now occupies one of the Ten Kingdoms as his own land of Mercator. In the passage that Death reads from the Grimoire, we learn that Apocalypse took the Perilous from a human, which is presumably Cade Kilgore since he was the last person in this universe to have possessed it. He then charges Mr. M as its new protector, and he foreshadows that a great sacrifice will need to be made before Mr. M can give it up to anyone who is seeking it. Dun dun dun! I personally am really enjoying this ride of a hunt for what is one of the X-Men's most mysterious and unnerving mystical objects, as Betsy's crew isn't the only crew on the trail for it. Merlin and Arthur have assembled their own menacing mob to try to steal the Siege Perilous from them, because they think that using it on Arthur's son Mordred will help purge the mutinous from him. We haven't really seen Merlin's forces go for the Perilous yet, they are still obsessed with killing mutants everywhere, but I think now that we know the whereabouts of the gem, we are probably bound to see a more direct conflict between the true troops over it. So that's the history of the Siege Perilous. Please check back again soon for my next video exploring what happens to someone when they travel through it, and all the drama that comes with that. If you like this video, you can bum around my channel for more X-Men content like it. I have reviews and rankings and histories and all sorts of fun stuff that's sure to pique your interest somewhere. You can also follow me on social media where I upload daily panel scans from whatever old X-Comic I'm currently reading. Join me on Instagram for some fun discussion and quippy banter, because if we aren't making fun of the mutant melodrama, then what are we even doing here? Thanks for stopping by and sharing this time with me today, and please be sure to come back again soon for more great X-Mentations.